Hello everyone, uh, this is Jason Tondro and I'm your professor for World Lit. Uh, you are coming, uh, you're, you're seeing me here in my study here at home. So you can tell I still haven't finished moving in yet. I still have boxes full of stuff filling around the house and uh, behind me are walls of comic books. Uh, this week I had, I'm asking you to read a couple of prose authors. For some of you, the fact that we're not reading poetry might be a blessing. Um, those two authors are Machiavelli, Italian, political scientist, uh, and second, a French author by the name of Montaigne, who was primarily uh, an essayist and uh, fam uh, famous for his autobiog autobiography or memoirs. Um, let's take these guys one at a time. We'll start with Machiavelli. His uh, excerpt in our book is The Shorter. It's not that much. There's really only about 10 or 11 pages. Um, there's some short introductory material on Machiavelli. Many of you may have had exposure to Machiavelli when you were in high school. Uh, I know that's the first time I read him. We, we uh, appreciate Machiavelli today primarily as one of the world's first political scientists, or at least in the Western literature tradition, um, one of the first political scientists. What does that mean? Machiavelli was a contemporary of Leonardo da Vinci. He lived in Italy in the 15th and 16th century. Uh, it's important for us to remember that Italy's political structure was, uh, until the 1800s, was very disorganized and fractured. Uh, this is my dog, by the way. This is one of my dogs, uh, Frankie, my, my Malamute. Say hi to everybody, Frankie. Uh, the, uh, the other nations of Europe, you know, you think of Italy, France, Germany, etc. These countries all consolidated under a single ruler into a nation state, uh, centuries before Italy did. In the 14th, 15th century during the Renaissance period and for hundreds of years following, Italy was a collection of relatively independent city-states like Florence and uh, Venice and uh, so on that were individually much weaker than any of the other nations that they were rivals with. And I'm talking about Germany or England or France or Spain. Now, individually, some of them had vast financial wealth. Venice, in particular, was extraordinarily wealthy because of its um, dominance of trade in the Mediterranean. But, but their populations were small, and their armies were small, and had a reputation for being not much good in the battlefield. And Italian cities, which were ruled by these individual dynasties, so you would have like a family that ruled Venice, and another one that ruled Florence, and another one, and so on. Um, these families spent a lot of time quarreling with each other. They spent a lot of time rival, uh, making individual political deals with outside nations like Germany and France and Spain. And they depended for a lot of their military uh, defense concerns on tribes of more or less independent mercenary units called condottieri. It's an Italian word. Now, these condottieri, these mercenary units, they were very colorful, and they have a very long and, and, and uh, flamboyant and exciting history. But what's important for us to remember as we read Machiavelli is that the condottieri would work for whoever paid them. And so if you were, let's say that you were a city like Florence, and uh, uh, you, you know that the... The Holy Roman Empire, which is to say Germany, that the Holy Roman Empire is looking at invading to conquer parts of Italy, and you would think, well, I could ally with them, or I could try to fight them. Individually, you've got no chance of fighting them, so you might decide that you would try to ally with them, and, and in return, you would pick on some other city in Italy. Like, okay, you will ally with the Germans, but we're going to fight the Venetians. Well, how do you fight the Venetians? Because the Venetians also, they, they, they know that a war is coming. So in this case, both Florence and Venice, they hire these mercenary bands and they hire these condottieri and they pay them a lot of money. 
and uh, and they have a battle and and maybe they even have a, a brief war. Well, then the war is over and Florence and Italy are both out a lot of money and uh, but the the mercenary unit lives on, you know, and the next time that there's a war, somebody else has to hire that same mercenary unit and it might be Florence or it might be Venice or it might even be the Holy Roman Empire directly or it might be some other city. And, and what you end up with is this sort of constantly shifting set of political alliances that no one can really depend on except for the mercenary units who can depend on making a lot of money, right? So it becomes a, a, a kind of permanently unstable situation. And Machiavelli was looking at his neighbors, like Germany, or which he didn't think of as Germany, he thought of it as the Holy Roman Empire, or looking at Spain, or France, or England, or even northern countries like Denmark, or Sweden, or, uh, or, or, or Belgium, or Austria, or all, all kinds of other organizations that are all forming up and thinking, well, how come Italy can't be a, united under one ruler? Why do we have to spend all of our time fighting each other? And why? Because, because we are divided into so many different political factions, it's very easy for an outside power to f make us fight each other. It, it's very hard for us to unite, and it's, it, it's whenever some other power invades, there's always somebody in Italy that says, hey, I don't want to fight you. I, I'll side with you, and we'll pick on some of my old Italian enemies. So it, it just it, it made Machiavelli really upset, especially near the end of his life. So, um, for much of his career, Machiavelli was a prolific writer, an industrious civil servant. He dedicated his life to, um, to his city of Florence, but he was consistently passed over for promotion. And we're not really sure why. Uh, in your introductory material, there's some speculation that he may have had a Muslim connection. Uh, in a previous lecture, we talked about the very important role of Muslim and Islamic empires in the Renaissance. That is, that much of the Renaissance depended on finding these uh, texts from ancient Rome or Greece, which had been lost to uh, the Western English-speaking, Latin-speaking world. These books had simply been lost over the centuries. But the Islamic empires, and I'm talking about places like uh, Constantinople or... Um, or North Africa, or the place that we would think of today as the Middle East, um, and the Holy Land, and Egypt and Jordan and uh, Syria and Saudi Arabia and all of those places. They, Iran and Iraq, they were all, you know, named different countries. They were all named differently uh, in the time period we're talking about, but all of that land space. Um, those were all Islamic cultures, and they had preserved all this literature. Um, translated into Arabic and preserved over the centuries, only for it to later be found by, by Italian merchants and explorers who came into contact with these Islamic empires in the midst of trading ventures. And I'm talking about people like Marco Polo and, and, and so on. Well, uh, there, there, so there's a great sort of, um, there's an, an an indebtedness to these Islamic empires, but there's also a great anxiety about the Islamic empires because um, the, the Islamic conquest uh, and expansion period, which happens between, the, say, the 6th to the 9th centuries, sweeps through all of North Africa, and then it comes up. If you imagine, you know, imagine the Mediterranean, right? And the, the Islamic empires start all the way on, uh, all the way on your left, um, with with what we would think of as Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq and those areas, those regions. But then it sweeps all the way across South Africa and then it, across North Africa, across the northern coast of Africa, and then it jumps over the Mediterranean to the southern tip of Spain. And then the Islamic world conquers all of Spain and they don't stop until they get, they're halfway through the Pyrenees, uh, which is the mountains that divide Fran uh, Spain from France, until they get, they get, stopped in France by the armies of Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer, whose son was Charlemagne. Well, um, 
and, and since then we've had the Crusades and and all and, and Venetian dominance of um, of Mediterranean trade was was being rivaled by uh, is, Islamic efforts in the same region done from north from North Africa and from from Egypt and so on. So you have a great admiration and respect for what we got from the Islamic cultures, but we also have a great fear and anxiety about those cultures. And this shows up in Italy with some legal discrimination against anyone of Muslim descent or Muslim origin. Uh, is, it, is it possible that Machiavelli might have had a little bit of this going on and that's why he couldn't get promoted? Well, maybe. We, we, just, we just don't know. Possibly... It's worth you know remembering that we just don't we weren't around that time. There's all kinds of reasons why somebody could fall off political fate, or maybe Machiavelli was just not a very fun person to hang around with. You know, there's all kinds of reasons why he got passed over, but passed over he did. And finally, by the end of his life, um, he he more or less retreated from um, the city, and he wrote this book called The Prince. Now. The Prince is part of a genre of literature, which we call the Mirror of Princes. And we call it this because there was a, uh, a common trope in these literatures of the, they were always dressed, they were written for a, a high-born, aristocratic, usually male, uh, Italian, and they were as what we might think of as instructional or educational manuals. They were designed to teach this person, usually man, how to fulfill the obligations of his high social class, how to be a good ruler, because these people were born into great wealth and great political and social power. And the conception in these books would be to hold up a mirror and the, the, the reader would look into that mirror and, well, what do you see? And what, what version of you do you see? And how can we make that version better? And there was a lot in these books about morality and ethics, how to be a good person and, and constant reiteration of, of how to make yourself a better person. And in so doing, you would become a better ruler. There's a lot about personal ethical code right, and morality. Machiavelli's book isn't about any of that. And that's what made it so groundbreaking. Machiavelli says at one point in the book, and you'll read it, you must learn to, to be not good. That is, Machiavelli is not here to tell the prince, the ruler, and he actually wrote this book for a particular person, for Lodovico Sforza, the ruler of Florence and one of Machiavelli's former patrons, that is a guy who, who would have, we don't really have a system of patronage anymore, but, but we still use that word, patronage. If you were a, an artist or a, um, a writer or even a scientist or a philosopher in, in Italy at this time, well, you wouldn't get a regular job. I mean, where do you go to get a job to be a philosopher? Well, or even an artist. You wouldn't even necessarily live by selling your art, although that's possible, and certainly a great many people did sell their art. But what, what you would try to get is a patron, which would be some wealthy member of the Italian aristocracy, who would choose to basically financially support you in exchange for you doing whatever you do to that person's glory and benefit. So, for example, if, if I'm uh, uh, a wealthy lord of Italy, or maybe a cardinal or a bishop or something, and I, I might take this painter guy, Leonardo da Vinci, as one of my painters, and I would become his patron, and I would, I would pay for him, I would give him a, a monthly salary, and he would spend that on his home and his food and his clothing and so on, and in return, he would paint whatever I wanted him to paint. He would... Maybe he would paint my church, my chapel, or he would paint a mural, or he would, you know, paint whatever I wanted him to paint about portraits of me or my family, and so on. Um, 
Machiavelli desperately wanted Lodovico back as a patron, and he and not only because of the financial security this would bring, but also because it would bring Machiavelli back into the political and social circles of Florence, which he desperately missed. So he wrote this book for Lodovico Sforza to be an instruction manual on not how to be a good ruler, good as in sense of a morality, but rather how to be an effective ruler over a good people. That is, in, in The Prince, part of Machiavelli's point is, is that the goal is for the city to be well run, for the people to be happy. Whatever you need to do to make the people happy is allowed as long as you are successful. This is not, by the way, about personal power and keeping power. A lot of people use Machiavelli to describe a kind of self-servingness, but Machiavelli isn't talking about that. He does acknowledge that, um, I mean, he understands that, of course, obviously the people in power are going to want to stay in power, but but his goal is is, is that the, the ruler, the prince, he may have to do wicked things, but he does this so that the people in the city don't have to do. They don't have to be wicked. They're not evil. The prince is wicked. And he does this in order to make the city run effectively. Maybe an example would be helpful. Okay, let's look in your book. Um, one thing that you'll find in Machiavelli's writing is that he has a lot of great examples to us as writers. He uses lots of examples. In other words, if you're asking yourself, well, how do I write this project? I've got a paper to write for my English class, for my history class, for my philosophy, or in my business, or my nursing class, or for my psychology class. I've got papers to write. How do I make my point? How do I illustrate the point I'm trying to make? Well, look at people who write like this. This is prose. This is prose nonfiction, which is the exact same kind of thing you have to write for your instructors. Machiavelli puts forward his thesis, and then he illustrates it with examples drawn not from imaginary stuff, but from history. So here I'm on page 185. Uh, the second half, the bottom half of your page. So what we understand is that um, he's talking about a particular duke. Uh, after the duke had seized the Romagna, that's this land, and he'd, found, he'd seized this territory and found it controlled by weak lords who had plundered their subjects rather than governed them and had given them reason for disunion, not for union, given them reason to break apart and to not like one another rather than to work together. So that the whole province was full of thefts, brawls, and every sort of excess. He judged that if he intended to make it peaceful, and obedient to the ruler's arm, he must of necessity give it good government. So then he picks this guy called Ramiro de Orco. And he picks this guy specifically because he is, quote, a man cruel and ready, a guy who will, who is ruthless. And he gives Orco um, complete authority over the city to do whatever he needs to do to bring in the crime, to crack down on crime and the fighting in the streets, and the protests, and everything. Okay, fine. So Orko goes in there, and he starts being like the most cruel taskmaster the city has ever seen, and he either bullies or intimidates everybody in it to obedience. This man, in a short time, rendered the province peaceful and united, gaining enormous prestige. Then, the duke decided there was no further need for such boundless power, because he feared it would become a cause for hatred. In other words, the people would say, hey, Orko's got unlimited power. That's not right. No one person should have unlimited power. We hate him. And the prince knows th that they're going to do that. And so, so he set up a civil court in the midst of the province with a distinguished presiding judge where every city had its lawyer. And because he knew that past severities had made some men hate him, because the prince had been cruel, well, excuse me, because Orko had been cruel, and so the people had grown to hate Orko. He determined to purge such men's minds and win them over entirely by showing them that any cruelty which had gone on did not originate with the prince, but with the harsh nature of the agent. People had gotten angry at the prince himself because Orko was the prince's man. Well, the prince, the prince is the guy that put Orko here, so if we hate Orko because he's cruel, then 
it's the prince's fault for putting him here. So then the prince puts Orko on trial. For what? For doing exactly what the prince told him to do. To be ruthless in cracking down on crime in the city. So getting an opportunity for it, one morning at Cezana, at Cezana, Cezana, excuse me, at Cezana, he had Messer Romero laid in two pieces in the public square with a block of wood and a bloody sword near him. The ferocity of this spectacle left those people at the same time gratified and awestruck. The, the, this, the ruler, in this case, he's a, he's a duke. The duke, in this case, had to crack down the city, so he finds a guy who's going to crack down really hard, puts that guy in charge. Then when the people, once the people are pacified, and they start to hate their ruler because the ruler's got ultimate power, the duke comes back in and he puts the guy on trial for the exact same thing that the duke put him there to do. And then how does that trial end up? With a public execution. And the guy's chopped in two pieces and left in the city square for everybody to see. And you got who do you feel sorry for here? Orko. I mean, Orko was just doing his job. He was just doing what he was told to do. But Machiavelli's point is, is that you... People are tools. You use them until they're used up, until their purpose is used up, and then you, you kill them. You, you, use, you, you get rid of the tool. And the ultimate outcome of all of this is that the people, they don't hate the prince anymore. They praise him because he got rid of the evil, wicked ruler of the town. He got rid of Orko. And he didn't just get rid of him. He did it in a cruel and bloodthirsty way that also kind of intimidates the people. This is classic Machiavelli. You, 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 you got a problem, you send somebody to deal with it, and then you give that guy ultimate power, and then after he uses that ultimate power and the people start to protest it, you sacrifice that guy and you take all the credit. This is where we get the word Machiavellian today. Uh, this whole approach, this idea that the ends justify the means, that it doesn't matter, their morality is irrelevant to successful rule, is exactly the opposite of what all of those Mirror of Princes books were about. And nobody knew what to make of this book when it came out. It, it earned Machiavelli nothing but scorn, and it certainly didn't work. I mean, if you think, what was his goal of writing this book? The goal of writing it was to get back in with Lodovico's Forza was to get his patron back and to get back into the royal court uh, in Florence. No way. Sforza wanted, he couldn't, he could not, he, we have no idea what Sforza really thought about this book, but he couldn't praise Machiavelli for writing this ruthless book of what many perceived as immoral and unethical behavior. Now, I think that, especially today, you know, a lot of people are, are, have very strong opinions on politics, and that's one of the reasons why Machiavelli is so great to read today. I think that his writing begs us to ask exactly this question, right? That's what this book is so great at making us ask. Do the means, uh, 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 do, does the end justify the means? If your end is good, I want this city to be peaceful. I want this land, this country to be peaceful. I want it to be prosperous. I want everybody to be wealthy. Whatever. If, if your end is good, are you allowed to do anything, anything to accomplish that end? I will lie. I'll cheat. I'll steal. I'll murder. I'll order the assassinations. I will usurp the power that our government uh, legally grants me and I will take, I will grab more of that power than I'm entitled to. I will do anything to attain my end. Is that a true or a false statement? These days, you know, if you look around our country, a lot of people feel like Politicians are just frankly no damn good at all. And, and they don't think that any of these politicians and rulers are really doing what 
they've been elected or chosen to do. And so people instead, they don't vote for that. They don't vote for who's going to run the country better. They vote on moral and ethical issues. They vote for a guy because they think that he's more godly or more good or more whatever that he's going to defend their personal moral and ethical causes. You know, I'm, I'm voting for this guy not because I think he's going to run the country well, but because he's pro-life or he's pro-choice or he's, um, you know, any one of a million other hot button social issues that we have in this country. Because I think that, well, there's, you get my point that people are, when, when, when Americans vote these moral and ethical issues, they're telling Machiavelli that the means are important. I would rather have a country that doesn't run well if it's run by good people. Or would you rather have a country that's efficiently run but is run by crooks? Sometimes I'm sure it seems like we have the worst of both worlds, right? We have crooks and the country still doesn't run on time. But, <laughs> but, but um, that's not the choice that, you know, that's the, that's the world that Machiavelli was already in, not the world that he was trying to get to. Maybe in some senses, some things have never changed. Um, what else can we address specifically in uh, Machiavelli's writing? There are a number of themes that we've talked about in our previous weeks that are going to come back to you as you read. Um, if you remember when we were reading um, The Wife of Bath's Tale and, and Everybody Since, Landval, and all kinds of writing, Chaucer, um, we brought up this idea of experience versus authority. When I say authority, what I mean is books. Are you going to, are, are you going, how are you going to learn? Who, who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to writers who have written books that are maybe a thousand years old, right? Are you going to listen to the great masters? Or are you going to learn from the world of hard knocks? Are you going to listen to the real world? And, you know, the, the wife of Bath is the great example of this, right? She's like, oh, the book's no damn good. Throw the book in the fireplace. I learned from living in the world. That's how I learned. And that's what we call, we're calling experience, what she calls it is experience versus authority, which is the text of ancient books. And, and this is exactly what Machiavelli is getting at. He's like, look, you guys have been trying to run cities by authority for 2,000 years. You've been trying to run things by reading these books about how to be a good person. That's all bullshit. You, know, you, you have to get practical. You have to look at the way things really work in the world, not how we'd like them to work, not how people should act, but how they do act. And if you start running your cities according to how people do act, you're going to find that you're a lot more effective. Uh, in, uh, on page 187 is the beginning of a chapter, chapter 25, in which um, Machiavelli makes this long comparison uh, that about luck, that how much can we depend on how much of success, how much of a successful ruler's rule is based on luck. Uh, and he makes this extended metaphor which he compares luck to a woman. Now this has come up in other things that we've read. This idea of what we, we it was called Dame Fortune. And we still have this idea today that, that fortune is kind of a, that l l there's lady luck, that fortune is a kind of woman. Because according to this very misogynistic view of luck, it's very whimsical and and pick and you never really know if why you're getting it or what did you do to get it. Uh, it's it's all very whimsical and um, arbitrary. But uh, the idea behind uh, Dame Fortune and you saw this as I mentioned very briefly in in the Inferno is that there literally is a kind of Wheel of Fortune. This is exactly where the game show comes from, and this is why we have Vanna White on Wheel of Fortune. Uh, or had, uh, that there's this, that luck is represented as a, as a gigantic wheel. And there's everybody in the world, everybody in the universe is on this wheel. And, and it spins and it turns and, and late and Dame Fortune is the one that turns it. And, 
uh, and she brings the low people uh, on the bottom of the wheel. As the wheel turns, they come up, they rise up, and they they become they get lucky and they they get prosperous and they get they get good jobs. They win the lottery and they luck out and and they make connections and pretty soon they're on top of the world uh, as the wheel hits its its highest point. But at the same time that she's bringing those people up, the people that were already up, she's pushing down. And you, you could be a king, you could be a prince, you could be the lord of men, and random chance happens, and now you're a criminal, and you, you don't have you know, a bed to sleep in. And this idea that everybody is going up and down constantly, uh, and through an uncontrolled mechanism that they cannot see and which is completely arbitrary and random, they symbolize as Dame Fortune. And that's what you get a lot of in this chapter. Uh, Machiavelli's argument is eventually that it's about half luck, that political success is one half luck, but the other half is being well prepared so that when good luck happens, you can seize on it, right? If you see a good deal and you're like, oh man, if only I had a thousand dollars, I could make ten thousand dollars. Well, if you're well prepared, you can capitalize on that luck. And this also, well preparedness insulates you against bad luck. Here we are. We're going to date ourselves a little bit on these recordings, but it's just a couple of weeks since Hurricane Sandy, right? There's still millions of homes in New York City without power. I liken her to one of those raging streams that when they go mad, flood the plains, ruin the trees and the buildings, and take away the fields from one bank and put them down on the other. Everybody flees before them. Everybody yields to their onrush without being able to resist anywhere. And though this is their nature, it does not cease to be true that in calm weather, men can make some provisions against them with walls and dikes, so that when the streams swell, their waters will go off through a canal but their currents will not be so wild and do so much damage. The same is true of fortune. The wise ruler prepares against that bad luck, right? There's an emphasis here on flexibility and adaptation. You're going to see this again later on in Montaigne at the end of our second half of our lecture. That the wise ruler doesn't have one strict thing that he sticks to all the time. Think about in our political fields today, and I don't know, once again, I don't know how much you guys are interested in politics or if you've been paying attention. Once again, is we'll, we'll date ourselves a little bit here, but this is just a couple of weeks after one of the most contentious elections in American history. And, and, and you know, you, we can't even talk about politics in our family these days because you know, half your family is Republican and half your family is Democrat. And if you're trying to put them at the same table and somebody mentions the president, it's just, you know, it's either a shout match or it's cold, hard silence. Well, think about how much we we value consistency in our politicians. Like, well, if he said this thing, if he's on this side of this cause, he's pro-life or he's pro-choice or he's pro-gun or he's, he's for the legalization of marijuana or he's, he's for tax reform or he wants to raise tax or he wants to cut taxes or he wants to you know, raise the defense budget or he wants to cut the defense budget, whatever it is that he said. You know. If he said it once, then he's got to stick to that for the rest of his days Right? And that's what we value. If you don't do that, we call you a, you know, we call you a flip flopper, or you've been wishy washy, or you you don't have any conviction, right? Machiavelli says it's all about flexibility, you know, because you have to be able to adapt and change to the times, and don't get too attached to the way that you do things or the commitments or the convictions that you've held, because, you know, maybe your pe maybe the people of your city need something different from you. It's 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 not about consistency. It's about flexibility and adaptation. And he gives another long extended example using a uh, uh, pope. Uh, remember that during this time, um, uh, the Catholic Church wasn't simply a religious institution. It had large land holdings in the middle of Italy. It had what we, they were called the papal states. They had, they had effectively a small kingdom uh, and, and with their own army and, and, and vast wealth. And so the Pope was a political player as well as a spiritual leader. And in fact, the families of Italy fought viciously over the right to become Pope. So eventually you had a Sforza, that same family that, that was ruling Florence, uh, got a Sforza into the, in, into the papacy. 
Uh, and of course, they became just as corrupt and wicked as you can imagine it would be, because these were politicians. They weren't they weren't here because of their religious faith. They were here because it was wealthy and powerful. Anyway, um, he uses one of these leaders as an example, Pope Julius, and he's talking about look. Julius's way was that he was always rash, and he dove into things, and he always went all in. You know, when he committed to something, he committed everything he had to it. And he was successful because of the times. The times were of the sort that if you were rash and bold and committed everything, you could succeed. But if the times had changed, if the times had changed and it would become a situation where you needed to be patient and you needed to not rush in boldly, well, Julius would have been screwed because he was incapable of changing the way that he ran things. And he would have gone into those new situations with the same bold rash that he's always had, and he would have lost, and he would have lost everything. This is my other dog. This is Byron. Say hi to everybody, Byron. Yeah, she's a good dog. Okay. Uh, now... Uh, Machiavelli's section on fortune being a woman it wraps up with a very um, famous and um, deeply misogynistic argument, which it's worth calling out, because that's why it's excerpted in this book. He says, that, look, if, if fortune is a woman, then how should you treat that woman? If we're gonna, how should you treat luck? How should you treat that woman? I conclude, then, that since fortune is variable and men are set in their ways, they are successful when they are in harmony with fortune and unsuccessful when they disagree with her. Yet I am of the opinion that it is better to be rash than overcautious, because fortune is a woman, and if you wish to keep her down, you must beat her and pound her. It is evident that she allows herself to be overcome by men who treat her in that way, rather than by those who proceed coldly. For that reason, like a woman, she is always the friend of young men, because they are less cautious and more courageous, and they command her with more boldness. He's saying, you got to be rough with her, because that's the only thing, that that's what she wants. It's, it's terribly sexist, right? It's terribly sexist. Maybe it was, maybe he wrote this way because he was writing to his audience. You know, Lodovico was a pretty sexist guy. Um, it's hard to say. Anyway, his argument is, is that, look, if luck is like a woman, then you have to be physical with her, you know, because that's, that's what she wants. And that's, that's how men get ahead with women is when they're, they just grab her and take her. So you should do that with luck. All right. So, um, the, the, the final chapter of, um, uh, of Machiavelli's book, and we only have a few chapters excerpted, and those excerpts are short. So, I mean, the, the Prince is not very long. You can read it all yourself in probably a weekend. But, um, but the final chapter is uh, uh, an invocation to Lodovico Sforza, the reader of the book, to be this guy. You've read all about how a prince should rule a city and how he can be very effective and efficient at it, and not by being a good person, but by being an efficient and effective and merciless one. And, and by always keeping in mind the goal, how can I best get the people to be peaceful and obedient, right? And that's the ultimate goal, not my personal goodness, right? So then whatever we have to do to get to that goal. Well, so here, I've given you this manual, he says to his words at the end of the book. I've given you this manual. So go take it and do it. Bring all the cities of Italy together. Bring them all together into one, one nation. Make, be, be the king of all of Italy. Unite us so that we can resist these foreign invaders that come onto our... Uh, and, and because Machiavelli had a lot of experience in the military, not so much as a soldier, but as a kind of military scientist, he had, been, he had learned a lot about the military... Uh, situation in Italy during his long career. He'd been in charge of various parts of the army and the, the logistics and, and training at various parts of his career. So he says, look, and he proceeds to give Lodovico Sforza a very specific blueprint for how to develop an Italian army. He says, look, here's our problem with our army. Our army sucks. But it sucks because the, 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 the way that battle is going on in the Italian Renaissance 
is that there's all these new tags that are being developed and nobody knows how to counter any of them. So like the Spanish have their secret weapon and the Swiss have their secret weapon and the French have their secret weapon. So, we'll, but, but each of these weapons is countered by one other weapon. It's like rock, paper, scissors, right? So like Spain has got rock and, and, and France has got paper and, and Germany has got scissors. But we need an army that has all rock, paper, and scissors in it, like a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of the third thing, so that when we fight the guys that have long spears, well, we'll have our guys with shields that can block those spears that can get in. And when we fight the guys with horses, we'll have the guys with spears that can fight off the horses and, when we, and so on. And, and, uh, and so he, he makes this idea for what any modern military guy will tell you is called combined arms, that if you have an army, you don't give them all the same weapon. You give them like a combination. So you have some guys that are good with weapon A, some guys that are good with weapon B, and some guys that are good with weapon C. And with all three of these things, you have more flexibility, which is the heart of uh, Machiavelli's argument in the whole book. Except now he's applying instead of politics, he's applying it to the military. So he tells Sforza to do this, and of course Sforza ignored him. <laughs> and Machiavelli died basically uh, uh, forlorn and broke. Uh, it, it, far from home but we still read his book today and and it's been tremendously influential uh, in the way that we think about politics and political science all right um well we've done about 40 minutes on machiavelli so that's a good uh, a good chunk let's pause here and then we'll come back and we'll talk about uh, the montaigne okay okay everybody we're back and we're talking about Montaigne. Now, your reading for this week in Montaigne is much longer than Machiavelli, and many of you might find it a little bit hard going. I'm not sure. Um, on the other hand, many of you might find it very funny. This is one of those few chances that we get to read something in this class which is just really funny. Now, you have to let yourself find it funny, though, and many of you won't. It'll be difficult and challenging enough that humor will go by the wayside, but maybe we can give you some enough of an idea of where the funny bits are that you, uh, you can allow yourself to have a little chuckle when you get there. Um, Montaigne's influence is, again, enormous. Um, Jefferson, Washington, Franklin, Madison, these guys all read Montaigne. Uh, Montaigne's influence on the early American um, founding fathers is profound. Uh, Frenchman, uh, brilliant by all accounts, uh, was raised in a very specific and peculiar way by his father. His father basically decided that he wanted his child to be a genius, a wonderkind, and so he he had this kind of um, uh, scientific uh, education system already set up for his baby, basically from infancy. So, for example, he hired a Latin nanny nurse to to, uh, someone who could speak Latin uh, to his son and and only spoke Latin to his son. So that Montaigne grew up speaking Latin as his first language. Uh, and then the other members of the family also were only allowed to speak to him in Latin and they had to learn Latin from him. So if Montaigne wanted someone to, to, um, to talk to him with vocabulary, he had to, to broaden his own vocabulary before they could do that. That is... They had to only use words that he himself had used. He, as a result of this, he, he had read all the Latin classics um, by, by the time that he was a kid. And he entered college, entered the university degree, and, and basically completed his degree as like the youngest graduate ever because he'd already read everything that the degree required. <laughs> so, a uh, intellectual genius. But also kind of a social misfit, right? I mean, it's kind of like modern nerds today, right? Who like grow up learning a computer language like from the age of four. And, and you know, they can only relate to other people that had that same kind of background. Well, anyway, by the age of 38, uh, Montaigne had basically retired from society. He had this sort of flourishing political career and then he, it had, apparently it had frustrated him where he hadn't gotten the success that he wanted. So he retreats to this castle, which he had inherited uh, from his family. 
And he basically never left it for the rest of his life. He, he was traveling at one point, and he found out he'd been elected mayor of a town. <laughs> Apparently, the king had, uh, had put his name in without Montaigne's um, knowledge or involvement. And so he came out of hiding to run the town for a couple of years, and, and, that, and that was it. Uh, but he, so he lived in this tower, and he had a huge library, and he, he just read and wrote, and that was his life. And, and he, he was very happy with that life. He was, we should not paint him off as some kind of bizarre, you know, snaggletooth recluse who, who hid away like Howard Hughes or something. He, he enjoyed being surrounded by the great literature of history and and he would rather spend time with those books than with any living soul alive, right? So he began to write his essays and these are letters essentially, or long essays, and, and he, he effectively created the essay format. The essays that you wrote in 1101 and 1102 and you read plenty of essays as samples in those classes, that genre of the relatively short, non-fiction, prose piece with an argument that is backed up by example, Montaigne. Montaigne created that. And as you read his essays in, in our book, it may strike you that you are reading essentially really short, interesting research papers. I mean, all the things that you're told to do in a research paper, he does. He cites authorities. He quotes um, famous people that agree with his point. And he, he'll introduce the quote, and he'll give you the quote, and then he'll explain it, just like any good uh, writer uh, of, of, in 1101 or 1102 would do. Uh, Montaigne is writing in the 1500s. And remember, you know, 1492, Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? So he's writing in the sort of age of exploration, the age of discovery. And he's writing specifically in the wake of the discovery and conquest of the New World by countries like Spain and, uh, and England and France. Uh, and he is responding to... Um, reports of what the Native American societies were like in North and Central and South America when the Spanish and other colonists arrived and invaded. Um, there was a lot of uh, sort of idealization of these Native American societies on the part of people like Montaigne, who viewed these societies as a kind of Garden of Eden, place that didn't have all the problems that that Europe had. You know, they didn't have politicians, they didn't have taxes, and they didn't have, you know, all of those, they didn't have religious wars and political wars, and, and they didn't have starvation and hunger, because they seemed to have everything. Now, in point of fact, as any student of Native American culture in, in before the age of exploration can tell you, the Native American cultures had all of those things. They, they had they had religious conflict and they had poverty and they had they had disease and they had um, uh, corruption and and war and all kinds of stuff. They had all kinds of problems over there. But the same problems that human societies pretty much have anywhere. But but in Montaigne's society and in Montaigne's books, they become a kind of perfect society in their simplicity. He acknowledges that they maybe didn't have all the science technology that European had, that Europe has, but that doesn't seem to be too much of a handicap for them in this idealized version of them. Well, they, and, and what we're getting at here is this sort of notion of a kind of naturalness, a kind of idealized living in harmony with nature. Um, you know, some days we would call that barbarism or savagery, but, but Montaigne's idea was the exact opposite, that by living in harmony with nature, um, they, they were a more spiritually pure people, and they avoided a lot of the flaws and foibles and mistakes that European society has fallen into. 
Uh, Montaigne, Montaigne's book was not well received when it was published uh, near the end of his life. Um, he, he says in the preface that he, his subject is himself. That is, he's, he's basically writing about, he says, I only know one thing really well in the world, and that's me. I know me, so I'm going to write about me. And this is going to be what I think about things. And, uh, and, and this idea that you would write about yourself, that my, the, the subject of my work is not God or, um, or how to rule a state or, um, or, or a, a play or political fiction designed to teach a moral lesson. I'm just writing about me. And this is every blogger in the universe, <laughs> right, is ultimately derived from Montaigne. That is, you're writing about something that your personal opinion, and you're going to argue your opinion about something. This, this was brand new to the people of Europe. You know, they, they didn't, they'd never seen anything like that. And it seemed really conceited. It seemed really self-absorbed and self-interested. And it seemed sort of um, uh, indefensible to, to, to use as your subject yourself instead of some quote-unquote higher theme, right? Why aren't you writing about God? Why, why, why don't you? Why are you writing? Why are you writing about something that that is long lasting instead of yourself? Well, what we find out is that when Montaigne says he's writing about him, what he really means is that he's writing about his view of things, and often his view of things turns out to be pretty provocative and pretty interesting, and that's why we still read him, and that's why a lot of the people that I mentioned earlier in our lecture read the hell out of him because. Um, and Shakespeare read Montaigne. There's a there's a passage in, in our book which is very close to a passage out of The Tempest, which is Shakespeare's last major play. Um, we won't read The Tempest this semester. Our book our book asks for Hamlet. Uh, but the, the Tempest is uh, comes very late in Shakespeare's professional career, although he lived plenty of years past it, but he appears to have retired. And he did a little bit of uh, co-writing, you know, once in a while somebody, some other playwright like Fletcher or something would come to Shakespeare's house and say, look, I'm working on a play, will you help me out with a scene or will you just sort of sign your name off on it and I'll give you some of the proceeds. And we have every reason to believe that Shakespeare did that with a couple of plays, but uh, but the last play that was his and his alone is The Tempest and it's one of, it's, it's, it's a magnificent piece. Well, much of it is speculative and it's somewhat about this new world. There's a, in, in The Tempest, these characters are trapped on an island that is very specifically located somewhere in the Caribbean. And there's a kind of local native guy who's been living on the island, and it's very easy to compare him to a kind of European vision of what Native American people of the Caribbean were like. It's not very accurate, but it's, it's a vision of what people thought those people were like. If that makes sense. Well, anyway, Shakespeare just straight, one of the characters in The Tempest just straight up quotes Montaigne and, you know, goes on for a few lines. So, Montaigne's influence was pervasive. All right. Um, I'm looking at, uh, our book starts on 345. If I had written to seek the world's favor, I should have bedecked myself better and should present myself on a studied posture. If I'm writing to Im impress the world, then I would make myself out to be this rich, handsome, brilliant guy. But I'm not like that, he says. I want to be seen here in my simple, natural, ordinary fashion, without straining or artifice. For it is myself that I portray, my defects, will here be read to the life, and also my natural form, as far as respect for the public has allowed. He says near the bottom, uh, Had I been placed among those nations which are said to live still in the sweet freedom of nature's first laws, I assure you I should be very glad to have portrayed myself here entire and wholly naked. <laughs> He's, he wants to be so simple. I, wanna, I, I don't want to show you any overly embroidered version of, version of myself. I want you to see myself as I truly am. And 
if I could, he says, if I was living in one of those countries that one of those early nations in the world where the rules of Eden still applied, then I wouldn't even wear clothes. That's how simple I would be. I would, that's how natural I would be. You know, I, I would appear to you completely naked. Metaphorical, but also literal, but also in a metaphorical sense, right? This idea that, you know, I, this is important for us to think about because we've talked a lot in our other literature, and you're going to come back to it later on, about this idea of fantasy versus realism. This idea of romanticizing something, making it brighter and bolder and more imaginative than it is. Talking about, we're going to write stories about, you know, flying on a horse to the moon, or we're going to write about knights and fighting dragons, or wizards, or all kinds of things. Or we're going to write about hobbits, or Hogwarts, or whatever. Whatever one of those fantasy literatures you want to talk about. I want to write about a submarine that has nuclear power and sails under 20,000 leagues under the sea, and I'm going to write it in the 1800s when nobody knows where that stuff is. The, these, these romantic fantasy stories, these imaginative fictions, can be seen as, as being sort of the exact opposite of the realistic fiction, the story that's about real people and real life and, and, and it doesn't have any of that imaginative power. It's not about that. It's about real. It's about being what's real. And Montaigne is firmly in that camp. I mean, you know, you, you talk about people that, that don't write realism, you know, people like, like um, the, the Arthurian fiction that we read, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, for example which is a rollicking good story, but it is nothing real. There is nothing realistic about that story, right? Or even Beowulf. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff in Beowulf, but ultimately, you know, it's got, the, the plot has monsters and magic and magic swords and dragons, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fantasy, but that doesn't mean we can't learn anything out of it. Now, I'm not trying to, those of you that know me will know that I, I'm not, <laughs> the last thing in my mind is to denigrate the, fantasy or imaginative fiction, but but it is fantasy and imaginative fiction. And and Montaigne is arguing for the opposite. He's like, look, what matters most is naturalness, simplicity, and what we would call today realism. And this is why you'd rather go watch a movie if it has those magical words inspired by a true story on it. Because you think, oh, well that means it must be better because it's real. And that's why movies like like um, paranormal activity do so well because they they have this illusion of reality. It feels real. It's exactly what Montaigne's going for. Okay, and he starts right off with an essay on the power of imagination. He wants to know, he, he's investigating this idea of how, uh, how, isn't it amazing how powerful the imagination can be? That, you know, when you, uh, he's got a, a lots of examples. He fills his essays with examples. So, for example, you know, when a doctor comes to a patient and the patient says, oh, you know, I, I, I feel sick and he describes a bunch of symptoms and the doctor, the doctor doesn't know how to help him. So the doctor just fakes a cure. He just makes up a medicine out of nothing. And he says, okay, here what you have is really serious, but I'm going to give you a really powerful medicine, and, and I want you to take this, you know, three times a day, every day for six days, and you can't miss even once, or it won't work. And 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 the patient it takes it, and over six days says, "Wow, I feel a lot better," <laughs> right? And how do we explain this? Well, you know, today we talk about psychosomatic cures, we talk about placebos, we talk about all this stuff. But Montaigne's point is: look, the fact is, is that your mind is making you better. You imagine yourself well, and you become well. And likewise, you can imagine yourself being sick. You know, if, if you hang out with somebody who's sick, keep in mind this is the 1500s, and our knowledge of medicine and illness was very bad. You know, we, we thought that in the, medi in the medieval period, you, you couldn't even really do, um, uh, you couldn't even really cut bodies open and examine them, you know, in autopsies. You couldn't really learn what anatomy really was because... It was against church law to cut open a body. And it wasn't until the Renaissance when you got people like da Vinci who said, screw that, I want to know how a heart works. So they would cut open a body, cut open a heart, and figure out how it works, and, you know, oh, it's plumbing, okay. You know, but but for a thousand years, you know, we didn't know any of that stuff. 
and we thought that disease, we didn't know anything about viruses and germ theory and all that stuff. We thought that disease was caused by little demons that live inside your body, and we thought that your humors were out of balance. We won't get into the principle of the four humors today, but the basic idea is, is that the body was made up of four different chemicals, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, white bile, and, and a healthy body had all four of these chemicals in a relative balance. They, you had all four of these together. And if one of them got, you had more of that chemical than any of the other three, it would affect your behavior. So if you were red all the time and you were angry or you had a fever, or you, had a, uh, you, you were hot, well, that's because you have too much blood. And how do we solve that? How do we solve the fact that you have too much blood in your body? We cut you open and we make you bleed into a bucket, <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is why going to the doctor in the Middle Ages was basically a 50-50 shot. You didn't know whether it was going to actually make you any better or was it going to make you worse. And if you think about it, that's exactly the worst possible odds. Because if, if the chances are good that the doctor will kill you, then the answer is clear. Don't go to the doctor. If the odds are good that the doctor will help you, then again, the choice is clear. Go to the doctor. But if the odds are 50-50, you don't know if the doctor's going to help you or hurt you, then it literally doesn't give you any best choice. You have no best option. Well, uh, so Montaigne is talking about how the power of the imagination and how your mind can, can have an incredible effect on your own physical body. And isn't that weird? Isn't that, and, and not just weird, but amazing. And um, he talks about all kinds of examples. He talks about how when we watch a play, or, uh, or, or when something happens in our life and how the emotions that what we see can affect us physically. We drip with sweat, we tremble, we turn pale and turn red at the blows of our imagination. And you know, last time that you saw a scary movie, you know, and it made your heart race or you jumped, or maybe you were watching a film or reading a story about somebody and it just really got you, you know, and you really sympathize with that person. You started to really wonder, like, wow, what would it be like, you know, or, or you watch a film and you cry, you know, there's got to be some cries out there on the audience. I know I'm talking to you. Okay. And then because Montaigne, nothing is out of balance for Montaigne. Okay. If you, when you read through this, you're going to, you're going to, your eyes are going to bug out because at some point you're going to realize that, wait a minute, he's talking about erections or he's talking about wet dreams or he's talking about impotence. Uh, or he, he's talking about his penis or whatever. And what you'll understand is, is that for Montaigne, there is no such thing as too much information. Right? <laughs> he's, this is part of his naturalness, what he's talking about. is that Look, this is me. This is all I know about is me. And so I'm going to talk about that stuff and I'm going to be absolutely brutally honest with you. And you know what? You may, you may laugh or you may think that it's weird, that I'm, but it's real. It's real. And you can't deny that, right? Uh, and so he talks about how, as an example, you know, there you are lying asleep and, you know, you're, you're a young adolescent male and you're fantasizing about something and then you wake up and you find out that, you know, <laughs> you had an accident in your sheets. And it's your imagination that made you do that. Often in Montaigne's writing, he cites things as if they were factual. For example, in the bottom of 346, he's talking about this, this woman, and I put that word in quotes, this woman, Marie Germain. And Marie Germain was a young woman who was very athletic, and she was running and jumping along with a bunch of her fellow women, when suddenly she ran and jumped and stretched her legs in such a way that boop, her penis popped out and she suddenly became a man. Uh, this is a folklore. This is a story. And, and Montaigne treats this as if she actually was a she who suddenly turned into a man because she jumped really hard, <laughs> right? Whereas, I think that we can imagine what really happened here is that Marie was a guy who was physically male, but was living as a woman in this village, and her disguise didn't hold up, and she had a, 
she had a, what do we call it now these days? Uh, a, a wardrobe malfunction. She had a wardrobe malfunction and her true biological sex became obvious to everyone. And that's where the story, that's how the story gets started. Montaigne doesn't get into any of that. He treats the story as if it was true. He does this again later on in, the, in the, our reading with all kinds of things about the Native American societies that the Spanish and Portuguese encountered when they came here. I'm talking about um, the, the people of Mexico City and, 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 and all of that stuff, uh, who were all conquered by the Spanish, Cortez and, and all of those, all that business. Uh, Montezuma, the, the Native American king in, in Mexico City at the time, um, Montezuma. Uh, Montaigne treats all of these stories, all of these folklore stories, as if they were true, so that he can make his point. I, I only bring this up because I think it's important for us to acknowledge that we don't know if he actually believed these things were true. Um, did Montaigne really believe that this woman turned herself into a man because she stretched her legs too hard. Does he really believe that the people of uh, America, before West Europe came, never aged and never got sick, that they lived in this kind of perfect Eden-like society where they, they had no want and no disease and no crime, does he really think that? Or is he just saying that so that he can make his point? Which is not about that, but rather about the society that he lives in. When he uses the people of Native America as examples, he's not trying to make a point about the people of Native America. He's making a point about Europeans. And he's just using the story to illustrate his point. Let's see if we can keep going and if we can come across some examples of this. He spends a good couple of pages on 347 and 348 talking about impotence and, and how the imagination can both cause and cure impotence in a man. Right? How it can be created by anxiety when he's sleeping with somebody that he's never slept with before and that he has a lot of anxiety over, right? But, uh, but once you know, we get over the initial hurdle and the imagination can help to compensate for all those things and can be the exact opposite of, of, of uh, impotence. He talks about how magic actually works not because the the stars are right or because the potion actually has any kind of magical powers in it but because your imagination makes the magic work so someone gives you a magic potion tells you the potion is going to make you fall in love with somebody or that that going to make that person fall in love with you and you drink the potion and you mentally maybe you, you believe in it so much that it affects you physically uh nietzsche you, you, many of you, and you may have taken um, Professor Culver's philosophy class, and maybe you've talked about Nietzsche, and, and you, you had lines like, you know, gaze not into the abyss, for the abyss gazes also into you. This is, that's, that's, that's from Montaigne. Nietzsche had read Montaigne. And this is what Montaigne's saying. He says, look, you, know, you hang out with bad people, and you're going you're gonna to take on some of their characteristics because of their imagine, your own imaginative power. What you see all the time it's going to affect the way you think and the way that you act. And it's going to happen and you won't even know it. No topic is out of bounds. On page 349. <laughs> People are right to notice the unruly liberty of this member. When he says member, he's talking about the penis obtruding so importunate, importunately when we have no use for it, <laughs> sticking out so bad when we don't have any use for it, and failing so importunately, that word is the worst, importunately, when we have the most use for it, when we need it the most, it fails us, and struggling for mastery so imperiously with our will, refusing with so much pride and obstinacy our solicitations, both mental and and manual. <laughs> you can see why this book, this was totally shocking to the people that were reading it, you know, in like early 1600s. I mean, we're talking about Shakespeare's time, you know. Uh, there was a translation of Montaigne that was available to Shakespeare 
uh, early enough that he, he read around 1603, 1605 or so, which is really Shakespeare's sort of high high point period when some of the, kind of the most, most amazing plays were being written. Hamlet was already written by then. Macbeth uh, was coming out right around that time. Uh, it's so shocking to people, right, that you hear you are writing about masturbation and stuff, you know, and, and, and you know, do you, do you have no shame? And Montaigne would say, no, I don't. Why do you? <laughs> right? All right. Uh, so, we have a long section. Uh, chapter starts on page 353 called Of Cannibals. And the reason why Of Cannibals is included in your book is because it's about these n new world Native American societies that we've been talking about already. And so it touches directly on us. I mean, this is Montaigne writing about us, our country, before it was the country that we live in today, when it was, you know, the pre-United States America. And, you know, his he's idealized that society, and he doesn't really see that we've improved it all that much by, by, bringing, new, by bringing European concerns to it. Let's see if I can bring up some examples. Uh, it's on 356, for example, that he questions this whole idea of civilization. He says, I'm sorry that Lycurgus, that's the legendary ruler of Sparta, that Lycurgus and Plato did not know of them. For it seems to me that what we actually see in these nations the nations of uh, North America before the Europeans invaded, surpasses not only all the pictures in which poets have idealized the golden age and all their inventions and imagining a happy state of man, but also the conceptions and the very desire of philosophy. They could not imagine, he's talking about like Curtis and Plato again, they could not imagine a naturalness so pure and simple as we see by experience. Nor could they believe that our society could be maintained with so little artifice and human solar. That is, not only do the Native Americans have this perfect idealized society, but they don't even seem to have to work for it. This is a nation, I should say to Plato, in which there is no sort of traffic, no knowledge of letters. When he means no traffic, he means the people don't travel. And there's no currency. There is no exchange, no um, barter, uh, no buying and selling. Uh, no knowledge of letters, no science of numbers, no name for a magistrate or for political superiority, no custom of servitude, no riches or poverty, no contracts, no successions. That's some um, inheritance, succession, that when the king's son takes over. The king is dead, long live the king. No partitions, no occupations, but leisure ones. No care for any but common kinship. No clothes, no agriculture, no metal no use of wine or wheat. The very words that signify lying, treachery, dissimulation, avarice, envy, belittling, pardon, all unheard of. How far from this perfection would he find the republic that he imagined? That's the Plato's Republic. This is an idealized political state that Plato speculates about in his book called The Republic. Now, it's easy for us at first to get distracted by his description of Native American society. But it's, as we've talked about, it's important to remember that this is less about Native American society and it's about what Montaigne feels it says about our society. He's using this idealistic Native American culture as a contrast to the culture he's in, which has all of these things that he's just said these Native Americans don't have. And are we better off for it? Are we really better off because we have money? Has money really made us better? Or has it just given us new things to worry about? Has religion really made us better? Or has it just given us something to fight wars on? 
Now, I'm not answering that question. I'm just posing it on behalf of Montaigne. So don't go crazy on me. Uh, he spends a lot of time describing reports of what these people societies are supposedly like. And he comes to the conclusion that their society is better than ours for all of its so-called barbarism. He says, Barbar barbarian, as far as I can tell, just a word that means anybody who's not like us. Whoever you are, whatever society you're from, everybody else is a barbarian. And the word doesn't really mean anything except what we would today call the other, with a capital O. And you, you'll hear about this a lot in political science and philosophy classes, as well as literature classes and history. And this idea of the other, where you, you figure out some political group or racial group or social group that's not like you, and you define yourself as the opposite of them. Well, all those people out there, they're clearly poor and backwards and uh, stupid, and, and they don't have anything to offer. They don't have any wealth or even, even metal. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we have all those things, so, and we're good, so they must be bad. And so we'll, we'll either wipe them out or we'll raise them up and make them like us. We'll give them all of these things. We'll, we'll give them money. We'll give them reading. We'll give them English. And pretty soon we make the other like us. And this, then we get to colonialism and all of that stuff. Um, He, he says uh, on page 358, I am not sorry that we notice the barbarous horror of such acts, but I am heartily sorry that judging their faults rightly, we should be so blind to our own. He's noticed that the people of, the people of these cultures, the Native America, sometimes they, they eat the dead. That's why the essay is called of cannibals, right? Some, some of these people are cannibals. They're, they do eat the dead. And, and that's horrible. He doesn't, he doesn't say that it's not. He says, and that's awful. But, just because they're awful, that doesn't mean that we can't find some awfulness in ourselves. Don't let that awfulness of them prevent you from noticing the awfulness in you. I think there is more barbarity in eating a man alive than in eating him dead and in tearing by tortures in the rack a body still full of feeling. In roasting a man bit by bit, and having him bitten and mangled by dogs and swine. He's talking about the way that, that people were tortured, and still tortured today. And one of a common, very common means of torture is to stick a, an animal on you. Or just stick a dog on you. And... If you're tied up and you're helpless and someone sticks a dog on you and you can't fight him off and the dog finds the small bits and he eats those first, it's gruesome. And, and that's exactly what Montaigne is talking about here. He says, look, yes, okay, eating a dead body is awful, but I don't see how it's worse than inflicting tortures on a person while they're still alive. In fact, he says to me, I think torturing a man is worse and eating them after they're dead. And we torture. So I don't really see how we have any room to criticize. Before you tell your neighbor to take, you know, about the mote in his eye, check out the beam in your own, right? That's exactly what Montaigne's talking about. Um, he goes on to make other arguments as well. Um, I'm on 360. He talks about uh, valor uh, and war. He, uh, the worth of a man, he says, the, um, the worth and value of a man is in his heart and his will. There lies his real honor. Valor is the strength, not of legs and arms, but of heart and soul. It consists not in the worth of our horse or our weapons, but in our own. He who falls obstinate in his courage, 
We quote Seneca here, if he has fallen, he fights on his knees. He who relaxes none of his assurance, no matter how great the danger of imminent death, who, giving up his soul, still looks firmly and scornfully at his enemy, he is beaten not by us, but by fortune. He is killed, but not conquered. The most valiant are sometimes the most unfortunate. Just because you beat a guy physically doesn't mean that you've won. If he kept his convictions, if he kept to what he believed in, and you didn't prove yourself any smarter or better by defeating him. You just proved that you were physically more powerful. That's all you proved. You didn't prove the rightness of your cause. You just proved that you had guns. Right? And he's, again, he's talking about the European conquest of North America as an example of the point he's trying to make. You know, you get a relatively small army of like a few hundred guys with cannons and muskets and, and, and horses. And, uh, and they have, by sheer physical might, they, they, they can do enormous damage to a Native American army that has, well, the Native Americans didn't even have, he's right, they didn't even have metal weapons. You know, a, a Native American sword at the time was a, a, a piece of wood with bone chips all along the side, like a like pieces of glass stuck in this piece of wood because they didn't have they didn't have iron they didn't have steel. Uh, how how are they going to seriously injure a, a Spanish conquistador wearing a a, a a steel breastplate, a helmet, uh, riding a horse, which again they didn't have, and wielding a musket, which can shoot people from you know yards away. Uh, how is a guy with a stick with pieces of glass stuck around the outside wearing, you know, wood pieces of bark sewn to skins for armor gonna, gonna stop that? And the answer is he's not. That doesn't mean that Western society is better. It just means they're stronger. And we should not have any illusions about what it means. This is Montaigne's point, and this is why we still read him today. Because, well, the shoe's on the other foot now. Now it's us here in North America, and we spend more money on weapons and defense in this country than the next 16 nations down the line added together. Yes, that's right. If you added up the defense military budgets of all the countries in the world, starting with number two, going all the way to number 17, and you added up all of those budgets, it would not be as high as the United States military budget. That means we've got more guns than anybody. We've got, now we're the ones with the power. But that doesn't make us right. right? Just because you can enforce your will on someone doesn't mean that you have the right to. It doesn't mean that you're any better than they are. It just means that you're powerful. It's not, they weren't, they didn't fall because they were weak, because they were, they didn't fall because they were wrong. They fell because they were unlucky. Right? They just got a bad hand. They happened to be on the bad side of your awesome arsenal. Montaigne has a lot to teach us. There's a lot in here that we can think about and learn from. Uh, his, another one of his essays is included in our book. It's called Of the Incon Inconsistency of Our Actions. This is what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about um, Machiavelli. Uh, Montaigne, I won't go on at great length here, but he, uh, he graces the ability that we have to change our minds. This is really, really good. <laughs> It's actually pretty amazing. It's one of the best things we can do, he argues, is to change our minds, to acknowledge that what we had thought is not the right thing to be thinking now. Maybe values have changed. Maybe we were just misinformed. Maybe we were wrong. Maybe, maybe it's time to change. Maybe we were waiting for something, and that thing has come. We are not always the same. We shouldn't try to be. 
and it's foolish to expect people to be always the same, and it's not fair to judge them because they change. Finally, his essay on coaches. This is a long one. It's hard to get at what his point is. Um, but he always has a point. And in this case, he's talking about the coach. The coach is like the wagon that's pulled by horses. And it's a metaphor for what he's really talking about. The coach is... Who, who's in the coach? Well, coaches are expensive. Not very many people get to own a coach. If you can own a coach, it's because you're rich. In his case, in this case, he's talking about the ruler, the king, or the duke, or the prince, or whatever you want to call him, the president, is in the coach. This becomes a metaphor, because the king isn't traveling to wherever he's going under his own power. He's not getting out and running. He's relying on the coach. And the coach is a symbol for what? For us. For the people. And Montaigne's argument is, is that the ruler is, is not the most powerful person in his society. In fact, he's completely dependent on the people that put him in power and that allow him to stay in power. Montaigne gets specific in his argument. He's talking about the way that kings and rulers had this habit of spending enormous amounts of money. And for those of you that are thinking that this book was written 500 years ago, <laughs> well, well, okay, 400, 400 years ago, it's, this is completely relevant today, because what are we talking about today? We're talking about how people, our country, is spending enormous amounts of money. And we have a deep uh, uh, suspicion of our political figures, people that we have put in power, and, you know, they don't seem to understand that, you know, we we put them there, we should be able to take them out. And, and the, uh, and those political figures should be doing what we tell them to do. This is the great American experiment. I mean, we have this obsession in our country. We talk about the government as if it was a foreign power, as if it was some sort of, you know, alien race that runs the United States. You know, we, we don't want the government to get involved. Okay, the government, what makes America so great is that you're the government. You. <laughs> you. are. You're the government. We, all of us, are participating in this self-governing commonwealth that we call the United States of America. And we. you can see now, remember how we started this lecture and I told you how Jefferson and Madison and Washington and Franklin and all those guys that have been Montaigne? Yeah, because <laughs> here it is, you know, that... that that the government is the people. And, you know, in Montaigne's situation, you had kings of France, and, you know, those kings weren't very responsive to the will of the people, and and they would spend enormous amounts of money. And Montaigne uses this as a, his best example. Like, well, the, king, the king will spend enormous amounts of money. But what he doesn't understand is that it's not his money. It's the people's money. It's the people's money. And... He should only be spending money for the people's benefit. Any, any, every dime that he spends on himself is money that he's stealing from the people. I'm trying to find an example here that I can read. Oh, yeah. So once again, he goes back to the Native Americans, right? And he's talking about the story where the Spanish arrived in Mexico City and sent messengers to Montezuma and, and, and gave him a combination sort of threat slash offer from the kings of, king and queen of Spain. Uh, coasting the sea, and I'm on the bottom of page 377. Coasting the sea in quest of their mines, gold, quest of gold. Certain Spaniards landed in a fertile, pleasant, well-populated country and made their usual declarations to its people that they were peaceable men coming from distant voyages, 
said on behalf of the King of Castile, the greatest prince of the habitable world, to whom the Pope, representing God on earth, had given the principality of all the Indies. In other words, all of, they thought, remember that Columbus was looking for a connection to India. And so we still call that region um, the West Indies uh, because um, Europe, uh, you know, Europe was originally hoping that it was a way that they could reach India without having to go by land all the way across, uh, across Europe and China. Uh, anyway, so they called it the Indies, the West Indies. Uh, that if these people would be tributaries to him, to the king of Castile, they would be very kindly treated. They demanded of them food to eat and gold to be used in a certain medicine and expounded to them the belief in one single God and the truth of our religion, which they advised them to accept, adding a few threats. This is Montaigne's summary of the Spanish, quote-unquote, diplomatic corps as they arrive uh, in Mexico City. The answer was this. As for being peaceable, they did not look like it. This is the answer given to the Spaniards by the Native Americans. As for being peaceable, they did not look like it if they were. As for their king, since he was begging, he must be indigent and needy. Since the king is asking, is, is looking for tribute, then he obviously is poor because you, uh, a rich king doesn't need tribute. And he who had awarded their country to him must be a man fond of dissension to go and give another person something that was not his and thus set him a strife with its ancient possessors. In other words, whoever it is, the Pope in this case, the Pope said that the King of Castile can have all of Mexico. Well, clearly, the Pope must want people to fight with one another because he doesn't have any right to give something that hasn't belonged to him for time immemorial to somebody those people haven't even met. As for food, they would supply them. Gold, they had little of. And it was a thing they held in no esteem, since it was useless to the service of their lot. Their sole concern being with passing life happily and pleasantly. However, they, the Spaniards, might take boldly any of it they could find, except what was employed in the service of their gods. As for one single god, the account had pleased them. It's a good story. But they did not want to change their religion, having followed it so advantageously for so long. And they were not accustomed to take counsel except to their friends and acquaintances. In other words, you're a stranger. Why should we, why should we do what you say, especially on something as important as changing our religion, which we've had and which we've got along just fine with for a thousand years? As for the threats, it was a sign of lack of judgment to threaten people whose nature and means were unknown to them. You shouldn't threaten somebody you don't know anything about. Thus, they should promptly hurry up and vacate their land, but they were not accustomed to taking good part of the civilities and declarations of armed strangers. Otherwise, they would do to them, the natives would do to the Spaniards, as they had done to, the, to these others, showing them the heads of some executed men around their city. <laughs> they could threaten back, in other words. And we get this very interesting portrayal by a Frenchman, by an educated Frenchman, of the kind of ridiculousness of European colonial aspirations. And of course, in Montaigne's vision, Montaigne had never been to the New World. He didn't know what any of these societies were really like. But in his vision, that king, the king of the Native Americans, was a good king, a responsible king, who answered to the will of the people and who understood that he was only king because the people allowed him and had chosen him to be king. And so he was, in fact, deeply obliged to them, deeply in debt to them, a debt that could never be repaid as long as he was king. And this is where we get back to the metaphor of the coach because the coach is really an imperfect metaphor. It's not very accurate to what's really going on. He says, what's really going on, it's not like a coach, it's more like a litter. What do I mean by a litter? A litter is when a ruler is picked up physically by people. There's no horses involved, there's no coach. There's just a chair and some wooden poles. 
and the people, you get, you know, eight or ten great big burly guys, and they grab those poles and they hoist those poles up onto their shoulder, and the poles support a chair, and in that chair is the king. He says, that's what government is really like. Let us fall back to our coaches. Instead of these, or any other form of transport, they had themselves, he's talking about again the, the Montezuma and the other kings of Native America. They had themselves carried by men and on their shoulders. That last king of Peru, the day that he was taken, was thus carried on shafts of gold seated in a chair of gold in the midst of his army. As many of these carriers as they killed to make him fall, for they wanted to take him alive, so many others vied to take the place of the dead ones, so that they never could bring him down, however great a slaughter they made of those people, until a horseman seized him around the body and pulled him to the ground. Montaigne says that's what we're missing. Because because the ruler has become so isolated from the people, because he's in his little bubble, he's in his little coach, right? He's forgotten that he owes everything to the people. And when the king does know, when the ruler does know that he owes everything to the people and he's responsive to the will of the people, then the people will die to protect him. As many people as those Spaniards killed, more. They didn't just volunteer. They ran up to pick that litter up and to carry the king further aloft because he was a king worth dying for. Because Not because he was great and powerful, but because he was responsive to them. He hadn't lost touch with what got him in the chair in the first place. Well, so I think that as you read Montaigne, I think that you'll find there's a lot of really timely, timeless, really appropriate stuff in there. I mean, I'm, I'm, everything that we've been reading this semester has been interesting and valuable, but, you know, this stuff, uh, this stuff speaks to us like nothing else we've been reading has. It, it, and as we read, as you're reading this stuff, it's getting more and more modern more and more accessible. And it's more and more like the writing that you read every day. It's not poetry anymore. It's getting more realistic, not only in content, but in style. And it's prose. It's not, it's not a drama or an epic poem. We'll, we'll read some more stuff later on. We'll, we're gonna, we'll get into next, next, our next lecture is going to be on, well, the kind of closing days of this whole romantic chivalry night thing. You know, we were reading a lot of night poetry, nightly poetry, stuff like stuff like um, Landval and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight and The Wife of Bath's Tale and so on. Well, that trend eventually hit its, went its maximum, its full flowering, and then it kept on going. So it sort of verged over into parody where it, you know, the, the idea of romantic fiction of of the romance, the fantasy, the adventure story of knights and their lovers gets cranked up to 11. And we'll read two of those next. One of them, Ariosto, and the next, uh, Don Quixote. And one of them treats that genre seriously, and the other one treats it as unseriously as you can imagine. All right, so... Um, there's our prose fiction, our prose nonfiction for the Renaissance, uh, Montaigne and uh, Machiavelli. I hope that you enjoyed it, and we'll talk more uh, soon.